and see the results. Okay, so uh, let me send you the link in case somebody does not have this. So this is the collab link for the spectrophotometry transmission, spe the transmission spectrophotometry lecture, which is the first part of the next lecture. So this will be about 30, 30 minutes and then Emily will give you the next 30 minutes, uh, which is on emission spectroscopy. Uh, Emily, please, once I get to 35 minutes, just stop me and I will, I will stop and maybe just, uh, yeah, then you can start. I, I will not eat into your time. So transmission spectroscopy. So this is a uh, so this is not transmission spectroscopy per se because you don't really want to get confused with transmission spectroscopy that you will learn about from high resolution spectroscopy. This is transmission spectrophotometry. So what we are doing here, we are doing photometry from spectra. Yeah. So please be very clear about this. So we are not really doing spectroscopy here. Yeah. So what? So this is a uh, this is this is a method for detecting uh absorption in the uh, atmosphere of a transiting exoplanet so when an exoplanet passes in front of its uh, host the star so if it has basically the right uh the right orientation the the orbit uh the disk of the planet blocking the disk of the star will mean that you have a dip in the amount of flux that you're receiving from from the star and so this is called a transit and if you have, if your um, planet is just an opaque disk, then if you look at this dip at whatever wavelength, the, how, much the, how much the light dips will be the same. And how much the light dips is basically uh, dependent on the ratio of your planetary area or area of the disk of your planet to the area of the disk of the star. Yeah. So it's basically proportional. The depth is proportional to uh, uh radius radi ratio of radii is squared right uh, of, so here you can see a differential transit light curve so this is what i'm talking about the light dipping and of course the shape and depth of this um, this transit uh, light curve depends on many many other parameters um, that's we will we will look at now, but we won't go into specific details of the mathematics of it. But uh, you should really read read into it at some point. But the point we are talking about here is that this this dip, if you have an optically thin uh, atmosphere or ring around your planetary disk, this optically thin atmosphere will basically absorb the, the uh, stellar light that passing through it at only a specific wavelength depending on what species you have in the atmosphere so if you look at the transit at that specific wavelength the planet will appear bigger right because you have the size of the planet is basically the disk the opaque disk plus the, the additional uh, atmosphere on top of that disk so what we do with trans transmission spectrophotometry is to measure this size change as a function of wavelength. So what we do is we are measuring basically the size of the planet with wavelengths. And this is what we, this, this is one thing that we call transmission spectrum. You will hear transmission spectra in later lectures that are, that's referred to as slightly different things. But essentially what we are doing, we are in all cases, we are looking at how much was the stellar light man manipulated by passing through the, uh, the atmosphere of, the tr transiting planets, right? And we are doing this in different ways as you will see in different lectures today. Um, so here you can see an example of it. So these are observations. So the data that you will, you will uh, work with is the data for, in fact, these observations. So it's a bit of a spoiler, I'm sorry. And these are observations that we're taking with, with the FORCE2 instrument, again, at Paranal, since we are at ESO. And this is an instrument at the category fo focus of UT1, Unique Telescope 1 at Paranal. And this is an instrument that has many different modes and it does many, many different things. It's actually one of the oldest instruments that's still working at Paranal. And one of the modes that it has, well, it actually has two, two specific modes that is very useful for us, uh, that is multi-object spectroscopy that it does. So what it what it that means is that it's able to take spectra of multiple objects in the field of view at the same time, and uh, so we are able 
So th this for us is extremely important because we need to correct for the telluric effects using a reference star. So here, the, uh, the spectra that we get are very low resolution. We are talking between uh, 200 and 1,000. Uh, so the, the, uh, the resolution of the spectra are not really good enough to fit with molecular fits and, and, and remove them. And air mass effects are also not so trivial to remove. But once you correct, once you observe a, a reference star, you are able to uh, correct these, um, these effects much, much better, as, as you will see yourself. Okay, so what we are doing here, we are basically measuring the, this transit as a function of wavelength, as a function of color. And we are fitting them one by one to basically get the size of the planet at these wavelengths, which is the transmission spectrum. And once we have that, we, uh, as you will hear uh, tomorrow in the lecture by, by Ryan uh, or, or, and, and others, uh, you will learn how you will then analyze that in order to get atmospheric information uh, about the planet that you're observing. But so that I will not talk about and I'll leave that to, to the experts obviously. So these are the three different grisms of force two. So this is the blue grism, this is the uh, visible grism or uh, uh, RI is called, and this is the near infrared grism. So we are basically covering the entire wavelength uh, range. And then you basically stitch these, all of these values together to get the final transmission spectrum. Um, okay. So um, I have put a series of data for you in, uh, in this directory again uh, in GitHub that I will run now. Um, so first we need to install Pi Astronomy. This is another um, very useful as astronomy uh, Python package uh, that comes with, with quite a lot of useful functions that will be helpful for you. And one that we're going to use here, that's why we are, um, we are installing it. It's not, it's, it doesn't come pre-installed with Google Collapse, so you have to install it. Anything that's not pre-installed, you have to install it first. And then we, we just clone the, uh, the directory, which is a zip file, and then you just have to unzip it. So once you do unzip it, you will get three directories in there. And the three directories in there are basically the data for these three data sets. What I've done is I've already reduced the data and I have basically produced one dimensional spectra for the star with the transiting planet. And I've already made the decision of what the best reference star was because I observed multiple reference stars and I did an analysis on all of them and then found out which one is the best one. So I've put only the best one in there for you. So what we are going to do is we're going to have a look at a set of these spectra. So I'm looking at the uh, the red data sets, but you can easily change that to blue, but then you will, you will need to change the, the directory names and the, and the file names uh, corresponding to what you have in there. So here you have, you have the spectrum of the uh, star with the transiting planet and the spectrum of the uh, reference star. We don't know which is which, yet, right? These are just, this is just one spectrum. But what we have is of course, because we are observing at low resolution, we, we do very high, very rapid time sampling of, of the transit. So we have uh, 200, 300, 400 spectra, uh, each of them that looks like this. So again, you can, you can already see that uh, O2 absorption band, right? But here it just seems like just two lines. And if you remember what we saw before in Espresso, there were many, many, many doublets in there, right? So here you notice the difference in resolution because the resolution of force, nominal resolution is 600. So you are not able to resolve even in individual uh, those individual telluric absorption lines. And you have, uh, you have an O2, you have a water absorption band here also, I think, if I'm not mistaken. Okay, so these are the spectra that we want to reduce. Also, sorry, we want to analyze, they've already been reduced. Um, oh, one thing I forgot to mention is this, sorry, this function is called asl.read1d fits a spec. This is a very useful uh, uh, routine from Pi Astronomy that you, you get it from here. That's basically, so what, uh, when, I, when I reduce this data uh, with PyRaph, uh, it, for the wavelength solution, it basically calculates um, 
the wavelength solution, uh, it, 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 the solution it gives you in, in terms of some, some header values, and you have to basically deconvolve that uh, in order to get all uh, the wave, actual wavelength solutions for all the, all the pixels. There is a, there is a very simple uh, mathematical relation to do this calculation, but just to save yourself time, uh, this function already does that for you. So it basically goes to the relevant headers and it calculates what is the wavelength uh, solution for every pixel. So, and it gives you two output arrays. The first array is wavelength, the second array is flux. Yeah. So in one line, you have the solution. And that's, that's how I read the wavelength and flux for uh, two a spectra, one, one for each star, and I plotted it here, right? So that's, I think that's quite clear what's happening there, right? Yeah. Okay, so what we, what we now need to do is for, uh, in transmission spectroscopy, once we, do, once we want to do the modeling of all these light curves we talked about, there are certain parameters that do not depend on the color. It doesn't depend on what wavelengths you look at uh, the transit, those, that parameter is going to be the same. Um, so in order to get best fit values for those, we actually do what, what we call a broadband uh, transit light curve. So we do a spectrophotometry on the entire spectrum and we fit that broadband light curve first to get, the, uh, to get all transit parameters. And we use the non-wavelength dependent ones as a strict priors when we go and do a spectroscopy of, uh, when, when we go and do fitting of a smaller narrowband uh, transit light curve. That part is going to be your exercise if you of course want to, want to go through it. So what we want to do is we want to basically integrate there is a spectra. So that's where the spectrophotometry comes in because we have a spectra and we want to do photometry on the spectra. So we want to basically integrate uh, all the lights that's underneath this spectrum. And you can do that with a simple uh, trape trapezium uh, Simpsons, Simpsons rule that obviously Num NumPy provides for you. You need to decide on um, uh, basically what wavelength you're going to use because the wavelength that you're going to use to integrate has to include spectrum, has to include flux values for both of them because the wavelength solution for these the stars will not be exactly the same depending on where they are situated on the, on the CCD. They will have slightly different ranges of wavelengths, as we can see here, for example. So you have to make sure that you use a common wavelength range for both of them. And then we basically need to then write a loop to go through all the spectra that I have and integrate them and uh, put the in integration um, in, a, in an array. So that I'm going to call light curve. Uh, so here in this next box, that's what we are going to do. We are going to cut the spectra between uh, 7,500 angstrom up to, up to one micron, which I decided from here, right? I'm just cutting out the very last bit here that basically there is very little signal there. And I'm just defining a very just simple function to cut the spectra, um, right? Be between two given wavelengths. And uh, so I am just sorting the, uh, the files that are in those directories. So I, I want to make sure that I do the loop in order because Python loops are, are unordered uh, by, by default you know, um, for, uh, uh, for a speed. So what we want to do is we want to make sure that I first of all put them in, 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 the, in chronological order and then I integrate them. And the integration is done in this, uh, in this loop. Right, so I'm basically integrating uh, the wavelengths and flux of all the spectra in one directory and the spectra in the other directory that I created here, right? I created, here I'm creating just two arrays with the list of all the files that are in the two directories and I'm looping through them. But at the same time, I'm looping through both directories with zip and uh, I read, I go one by one. I read um, one file, I integrate it using uh, the integration uh, package, uh, an integration routine from SciPy package. SciPy is something that uh, is, is, is one of the most uh, used Python packages that we use in, in science and of course in astronomy too. And uh, integrate has, has different integration methods and I'm using just the Simpsons integration. And I am basically just 
cutting the flux and the wave. So I'm basically giving it flux and wavelength cut for these two values, right? That's all I'm doing. So I'm, I'm cutting the flux between wavelengths 7,500 and 10,000, and I'm cutting the wavelength between 7,500 and 10,000 because, of course, they need to have they need to have the same um, uh, same number of array, uh, same number of elements. I guess another another method would be just to give integration limits, right? And that's also I think is a possibility. And I do the same, and and I append basically the integration value to this empty array that I created up here that I call LC1. So this is going to be light curve for star one and the same for star two in the other directory, right? Um, what we also need is information about the time, time stamps of all the spectra and the, and the exposure time that I used for the spectra. So I, I did these observations myself and I like to change exposure time because uh, I prefer not to have even sampling and also depending on the air mass, of course, the amount of flux you're getting is changing. So I try to maintain kind of a constant level flux for all the observations that I have. So as the star is going down in the sky or coming up in the sky, I need to increase or decrease the exposure time to, to ensure uh, that I have kind of similar flux. And an additional advantage of changing exposure time, at least in my opinion, is that uneven sampling gives you uh, better modeling of any correlated noise that you might have uh, in your in your light curve, which we will not go through because it's just too much for uh, for this half an hour lecture. So the time and exposure time are um, are stored in uh, in ASCII files in, in the directory. So here I'm, I'm I'm calculating just photon noise errors, uh, uh, assuming just photon noise. I'm just calculating what the errors are, percentage errors, and adding the percentage errors, and I'm dividing the light curves by the exposure time because otherwise your light curve is going to be jumping all over the place, right? The amount of flux is changing. So I, once I run all of that, it does all the integrations and it has now stored the light curves in LC1 and LC2, right? Let's plot them. So I'm going to plot the individual light curves for the two stars. And I'm just going to divide by their mean so that they're not upset too much. And, what I, and then what I will do is I will divide the light curve of the star with the transiting planet by this, by the reference star. And you will see then the reason why we in fact observe reference stars. So let me not show you this first. So this is the in. So you you can clearly see that in fact it was a star two that had the um, that had the transiting planet, right? You can see the signature of the transit, and the star one is basically the reference star. So as you can see, they both have this pattern, this uh, kind of low frequency pattern, which basically comes from the change in the air mass of the field because we observe for three, four hours at least. And then you have this high frequency um, noise in the light curve that is basically due to changes in the seeing in the, in, which comes from turbulence in the, in, in, in the atmosphere. Um, so as you can see, if I just want to model this alone, the, the light curve looks quite noisy and it looks kind of a little bit warped. And, but once, if I divide one, the, my transiting light curve by the reference light curve, as you can see, the light curve becomes much, much smoother. And a lot of those effects that we mentioned disappear. They don't, miss, they don't miss, disappear completely and they're never going to. Uh, both the, uh, the long trend and the high frequency noise. This of course, because of um, Poisson statistics, because of in fact that the two stars are slightly, a few arc, arc minutes, it could be up, up to a few arc minutes away from each other. The stars have different colors, so they will be affected uh, with, by the atmosphere differently at different air masses. And that's why you, have, you still have this trend, right? Which basically comes from um, uh, color differences. I've mentioned a few of those sources uh, here. Typically, uh, so this is the light curve that we want to model. Uh, but what we are going to do is for now, just for simplicity, we are going to remove this out of transit trend and we are going to basically normalize our light curve. So we're going to div divide by this trend. So we have out of transit le level at one, just to make our modeling easier. But in reality, when you do science, you want to include that out of transit model in, in your fitting in order to ensure that all its errors are propagated uh, correctly into your final posteriors. But here, just for simplicity, 
all I am doing, I'm basically fit. So I'm deciding where the out of transit part is. I select only those data sets and I call that uh, LCOOT or out of transit and time out of transit. Um, I'm not quite sure what happened. Yeah. Yeah. So green is basically the part that I'm fitting. So I only want to fit out of out of transit, and I'm fitting it with a low order polynomial. You can you can experiment this yourself. You can experiment. So here is the order of the polynomial that I'm fitting. So you can change the order to see what order fits best. You want to minimize the number of free param parameters as much as possible. So if there is no need statistically to go to higher order polynomials, you shouldn't and you should stick to the lowest order that uh, you can. So once I have that, I divide, I divide by uh, my out of transit model and I have my final transit light curve, right? And this is the one that uh, I'm going to I'm going to model, yeah. Okay, so the next uh, next 10, 15 minutes we will in 15 minutes. That's how much time I have, Jiri, No. Uh, you have probably 10 minutes, like if you want to switch at uh, 30. So okay, good. And we can have 30 minutes. Okay, so here I've basically put in for you uh, just. Uh, basics of Bayesian analysis and Bayesian relation. I assume all of you, at least being undergraduate students, you are very familiar with the Bayesian relation and the, uh, and the likelihood function. So here I'm assuming just a Gaussian for the likelihood in log space. Um, I'm explaining to you why we work in log space and not, uh, not probability space. Uh, one very important note, note that I've put here in, uh, in black is that basically since already many years, if you just do the modeling this way and assume that your noise is just um, uh, uncorrelated Poisson noise, no referee, no, no publication will accept because it's uh, here I've, I've put in rarely is white, but the answer the, in reality, it's never, the noise is never just Poisson. It's not, it's never just photon noise. You're always going to have some sort of systematic noise on top of your, uh, your Poisson noise that you have in your, um, in your light curves. So there are, of course, different approaches to, um, to fitting correlated noise. So basically, uh, and, and the most popular by, uh, of, of those methods has been Gaussian processes, which is a kind of a very, very heavily supervised machine learning um, algorithm. And uh, you basically, so in, in Gaussian processes, what you do is you redefine this, uh, you, you redefine your likelihood but you include the full covariance matrix and not just the diagonals of the covariance matrix, which are the, which are the variances. You actually, and you model your covariance matrix and that's what the Gaussian process is. Uh, there are packages that allow you to do this. There are many, but I've just mentioned here two of them. And Juliet from Nestor, that he, he's one of the invited speakers and GP from Neil, who's also another of the invited speakers. So maybe they will, uh, if you have any questions specifically about those packages, you can speak to them, but they are very popular packages for fitting transit light curves or radio velocity values, including a GP component. Okay, uh, I am going to fit, uh, so going through a transit uh, analytical model, of course, is way, way beyond the half an hour that we have here. Uh, thankfully, you, you hardly ever have to go and uh, write this from scratch for yourself because it's not, it's not trivial. The, the analytical definition you can find in Mandela, Mandela and Eagle, who were the first to, uh, to formulate an, an exoplanet transit, but there are, there are other, other possibilities also. So I am going to fix this with the, with, the, with the package called Pi Transit, which is from Hanu Parvianian at, at the IAC which is a very nice uh, self-explanatory package for fitting, uh, fitting transit light curves. There are many more. I have no particular preference um, uh, from one, one to the other, but this, uh, and, and a lot of the material that I'm going to use here, use here is basically coming from, from the docu documentation of Pi, Pi Transit. Uh, and we are going to import whole one, Whole bunch of different things that we need. Since I'm very short, uh, short on time, I'm just going. Please have a look. Any 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 questions about what we are um, 
what we are importing here, let me know. Um, and then we define our likelihood function and we are going to uh, decorate it uh, so that it will be translated to machine, uh, machine code, which can then be run much, much faster. Um, this, if you run it on your own machine, you might find the uh, installation of Numba not so trivial. So in case you have really, you're struggling to run it on your own machine, just comment this line out and change P range to range. I've, I've put comments here. And uh, then you can just run it on, on your normal CPU and it, it will just take a lot longer to run. And then to basically perform the analysis, uh, there is a, from, from, the, uh, from the PyTransit package, there is a, um, LP function class that encompasses the uh, the log posterior, all the all the plotting things, and all the running of MCMC, running the differential evolution um, algorithms. Everything all has been encompassed into in, into one one class. Please take take time to read through it. I'm sorry, I don't have I don't have time to go through all the all the details. I didn't think that I would, but I think it's it's quite important for you to go through uh, like optimization. Uh, routine that it has, sampling routine that it has. Um, so, so basically the steps are, so, so we have a model uh, and we have, we have the Bayesian relation and we first of all run an optimizing algorithm to find kind of best solutions. And then we run MCMC starting from those best solutions uh, for multiple um, Monte Carlo simulations in order to obtain posterior uh, distributions for all the parameters that we want to fit, right? So all of that, all of that has been encompassed here with all the all the plotting made simple for you. I'm just going to load this class. And so there is a quick note about priors. So priors is quite important. You have to make sure that you are not too restrictive with the with the prior that you can, you take for the so the, the information that you already have. So for example, for limb darkening parameters. Uh, the standard ones, we are sure that it has to be between zero and one, between minus one and one, if you're using the quadratic limb darkening parameters. Limb darkening is basically the, the model that describes how the uh, intensity of lights going from the limb to the center of a star changes as a function of viewing angle. Um, or I don't know, for, for, a, for a period, if you're fitting the uh, period of a, of a transiting planet, you know it has to be bigger than zero, of course. Uh, typically, you know, you, you already know the period for a transiting planet from the RV survey, so you usually uh, fix that if you're, especially if you're fitting a single transit. Okay, uh, so please have a look at, uh, so have, have a read through what I'm, I'm, I'm describing here about limb darkening and, uh, but the one that we are interested in, of course, was the like likelihood. That's, that's a very, very important function that we defined at the beginning. So we create an instance of this LP log posterior function class. And we call it red because it's the red data set and we give it time and we give it, of course, the flux values. Uh, some MCMC and differential evolution uh, parameters. And we basically run, first of all, the uh, global optimization algorithm. And that gives us um, some initial values to start our, to, to initiate our, uh, our walkers. And we can basically plot the transit light curve for the data points with the parameters that we get from the optimization algorithm. Yeah, so it already looks quite good, right? But we, of course, we want to improve on this, and we want to get um, we want to get a view of the posterior probability distributions for all, for the three parameters from which then we derive the precision for each parameter, right? And that's what we're going to do. So I decided to run three very short MCMC chains for uh, demonstration purposes. Please go back to this, play around, increase the, increase the steps, increase the number of chains to ensure better, better convergence as you, can, as you will see now that in fact, these, these chains are nowhere near uh, long enough. But yeah, but this will take if, if you're not uh, if you're not running this with uh, the uh, with the likelihood function decorated with Numba, this will take a lot a lot longer. Huh? Uh, I I highly recommend uh, to to those of you that code in Python to really get familiar with the Num with, with the Numba class because it's really really beneficial for speeding up your code. 
So this now takes maybe a few seconds to finish, as you can see, about uh, 15, 20 seconds. Without it, it would have taken about maybe five, 10 minutes to finish each, each chain. And that's done. So now we can replot the model, the transit life curve that we fit, but with these slightly improved parameters that we obtained from the MCMC run and also includes the uncertainties of the model, yeah, which is shaded, but it's kind of hard to see, but it is there, right? So that's our, that's our fit. And clearly the model obviously is underestimating the uncertainty in the, in, in the transit light curve because it's not assuming any correlated noise that clearly, as you can see, there is some correlated noise, uh, noise present. Okay, then uh, we look at our chains that are that are stored in this uh, in this array, well, in this array, and we flatten them. So we put all the all the chains together, and we just have a look at them. So we we thin them first of all, and then we we, we take a random selection. So we don't look at all of them, uh, and then so this is the transit light curve. Just zooming into this. Uh, interesting region of uh, ingress egress and replot just taking only a, a subsample of the of the posteriors and these are the results from the from the chains so for each parameter that we fit please have a look at all the definition of these parameters for a transit fitting it's given in the in the log posterior function transit mid, mid transit time period all of these things um, are defined any any doubts please let me know and finally, we can look at the posterior probability distributions for all the fitted parameters and only plot the interesting ones, which is the radius ratio. So this is the one that we care about. So this is uh, the ratio. So this is the ratio squared, RP over R star squared. So from this, then you determine what your median solution is, what, what are your upper, um, upper and one, one plus or minus one sigma solutions. And as you can see, clearly, there wasn't a very good uh, convergence at all for the impact parameter. So you should really go back, review your uh, priors, re review the length of change that you're running and, and repeat doing this. So that's it, I'm, I'm out of time and this is finished. So what I would like to you to do is, you don't have to, but if you really want to, uh, really go through the analysis. So look at basically what I've done and try to reproduce this first of all for all the three data sets. So model the broadband transit light curve for each of the data sets, right? So you will do three modeling first of all. Write down all the best fitting parameter values for, uh, all, uh, for all the parameters that you fit. And then go back and mod uh, modify the code so that you will do the integration, not for, the, for a full wavelength domain, but integrate for a small, let's say 200, 300 angstrom bins. So divide it up. So you, you will need to write an extra loop to do the integration within these bins and store your light curves. Uh, so a spectrophotometric light curves in, in, different, um, uh, in, in different arrays and fit those with the same, uh, the same procedure that we fitted, but you will need to adjust your priors, which are given here. And for those parameters that are not wavelength dependent, put a very, very strict, almost Delta function uh, prior on it, like I've done here for the period. So basically very, very narrow Gaussian to make sure that you fix the value of that parameter. So in fact, when you go to a spectrophotometric light curves, you will fit only these two coefficients, the area ratio, yeah, and uh, the scaling of errors. Yeah, that's all. Everything else you should, you should fix to the value of broadband, uh, that you can, the value you get from the broadband um, fits for, for each data set and see if you can come up with the trans transmission spectrum. So what you will get then at the end is you will get um, planet radius as a function of wavelength, which is the center of the bin that you choose and see if you can plot that to together for all three data sets uh, to cover the entire wavelength domain. And for those of you who can get that, then Ryan or um, uh, Eleonora, 
uh, or Evers will show you, or many others, of course, will, all, the, all the modelers will show you how to interpret that and actually how to get, um, how to retrieve atmospheric information from that transmission spectrum. Yeah. And I, yeah, I'm sorry, I ran a few minutes over. So I, I stop here, please. Any questions? Uh, the Slack, Slack channel is open. So hopefully you can, you can maybe work on this and we can have maybe, I, I doubt you will be able to obviously get this uh, done by, by tomorrow when, when we have the modeling lectures, but if anybody can do great, if not, obviously we, 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 have, we have the transmission spectrum to work on. But yeah, see if, see if we can maybe get it by, by the end of the conference, by the end of the week, and uh, we can compare two results that have been published already from those data sets to check for consistency. That would be nice. Okay, then I stop sharing and I pass to Emily. Hello.